Hello, everybody. We warmly welcome you to this uh, webinar on rate limiting graph QLs using depth and complexity analysis. My name is Fazlan Nazim. I'm an associate technical lead at WSO2, working for the API manager team. Along with me, I have uh, Ruvini Vijay Siri, who is a senior software engineer, also from the API manager team. Today, we both will be hosting you through this webinar and discussing a practical and proven approach to rate limit GraphQL APIs. If you have any questions related to the webinar, you can ask them out in the questions tab, either during the webinar or after the presentation ends. We would also be recording the session and sending out the slides for all the registrants via the mail. Following is the plan for the next 40 to 45 minutes. We will first understand the basic concepts of GraphQL and then look into how it differs from REST. Then we will go on to discuss some of the issues related to GraphQL's expressiveness. And subsequently, we will introduce some solutions and discuss the advantages and drawbacks of those. Then we will demonstrate how this particular problem has been solved in API Manager 3.2. Finally, we are hoping to take a few minutes to answer some of the questions presented by the audience before we wind up the session. Okay, so what is GraphQL? GraphQL is a query language for APIs and a runtime of fulfilling those queries. It shouldn't be mistaken for a programming language. It was originally developed by a team at Facebook to resolve some of the issues related to its mobile application. But what they realized was that this in fact is not a solution suitable only for Facebook. So the team came up with a generalized version and open sourced a specification and a reference implementation within three years time in 2015. The reference implementation is in JavaScript. However, GraphQL implementations for the client and server for various other languages are also freely available so that your existing systems can be integrated with GraphQL easily. Some large organizations have come along and formed a foundation for GraphQL. Many of these organizations are already using GraphQL for their internal application applications and some have already exposed their public APIs with GraphQL. So GraphQL APIs typically have a single endpoint which exposes the full set of capabilities it provides. Whereas in a RESTful architecture, each capability will have a separate endpoint. One of the fundamental concepts in understanding GraphQL is the GraphQL schema. What you see on this image is an example GraphQL schema. Each API will have a schema similar to this, which the clients can use to derive the queries. It defines the contract between the client and the server. So once it is defined, the client will know what data can be queried or modified on the server. It can answer questions such as what fields can be selected, what kind of objects might they return, and what fields are available on those sub-objects. This is written in a language called the GraphQL schema definition language. There are some special root types, which are query, mutation, and subscription. What you see on this image on the bottom is a query root type. This is an example of a GraphQL query. This, in this example, 
the GitHub GraphQL API has been invoked asking for information such as the login username, the company, and the number of repositories in, in my account. As you can see on the right, the GitHub GraphQL API has responded with those details. Nothing less and nothing more. What you see on this image is a mutation example. GraphQL mutations are used for creating, updating, and deleting resources. In this example, a mutation is being invoked to create a person named Alice with age 36. And once it's created, it's asking for the ID of the created user. As you can see, the response has sent the ID of the created user. Subscriptions are used for real-time updates. This means for use cases such as chat applications or stock trading application. A single request will be followed by a stream of responses in subscriptions. In this example, the client is interested in comments added to the server. Once someone comments on a post, it will be notified to the client via a supported protocol such as web sockets or web hooks. One thing we cannot avoid talking about GraphQL is to see how it differs from REST. It is important to comprehend the similarities and differences in order to choose the right tool for a particular job. Let's take a hypothetical example of a social media application. This application needs to display the name of the user, the titles of the post of that user, and the name of the names of the last three followers of that user. Let's assume the application has the user's ID. Now in a RESTful architecture, this is how the communication will happen. First, the REST client will talk to the user's endpoint to fetch the user data. Then it will talk to the post endpoint to fetch all the posts of the user. And finally, it will talk to the followers endpoint to fetch the followers of that user. Let's see how the same requirement is achieved in a GraphQL architecture. As you can see on this image, the GraphQL client is requesting for the name, the titles of the post, and the last three followers of the user using a single query. And the GraphQL server has responded with exactly those details. So if you compare both REST and GraphQL, the main difference here is that the rest, in the RESTful architecture, the client had to send three requests, whereas the graph, in the GraphQL architecture, it had to send only a single request. Let's see some of the advantages of GraphQL. It gives more control to the clients. So as we saw in the example, the client had full flexibility in querying anything it wishes. This enables applications to easily achieve its use cases without a hassle. So there is no more overfetching and underfetching. In order to understand what these two terms mean, let me go back to the previous slide. So in this example, if we take the first endpoint which is a user's endpoint the server has responded with the user's id the name address and the birthday but the client was interested only in the name of the user so this is an example of overfetching data underfetching means the inability of a single 
endpoint to provide all the data which the client requires. So as we saw in this example, the client had to talk to three different endpoints to fetch the required data. So this is an example of underfetching as well. So in GraphQL, it solves both overfetching and underfetching. One other advantage is that it becomes the applications become less chatty. Since the number of round trips required to achieve a use case is reduced to a single request, this saves a lot of network bandwidth for both the client and the server. It enables rapid application development. Changes on the client side can be made without any extra work on the server. Since clients can specify the exact data requirements, no backend data engineer needs to make adjustments when the design and the data requirements in the front ends change. So this uh, gives the ability to build APIs that are easier to evolve. So this list is not an exhaustive list of advantages and this also does not mean that GraphQLs do not have any disadvantages. Since the focus of this webinar is different from the advantages and disadvantages, we will leave that topic for another time. So GraphQL gives enormous power to the consumers. But as the saying goes, with great power comes great responsibility. So what can go wrong? Deeply nested queries. So assume a GraphQL client sends a deeply nested query as follows. This type of query's depth can grow indefinitely and the backend service can be disrupted since it can be costly to resolve a large number of fields. Therefore, allowing deeply nested queries to be executed in your GraphQL backend without any protection can end up in a disruption of service. Next, computationally expensive queries. So although the depth of the query is low, there can be some fields which are very expensive to resolve on the backend. So if there are such fields in a query, we call them as computationally expensive queries. So if there is no protection against such queries as well, this could also end up in a service disruption scenario. So this brings us to the point that GraphQL's expressiveness is risky. The risk is actually for service providers, not for the clients. If many GraphQL clients request large amount of data, maintaining the availability of the endpoint will be a tough task due to the extra processing needed. So a small query can end up sending a large response. It has been reported that over 80% of the commercial large scale open source schemas permitted exponentially sized responses according, according to recent studies. So the API designers are lacking a principled approach to estimate the query cost. So this results in a state where the backend cannot decide which queries to execute and which do not. So what's the solution? The solution is to implement some kind of rate limiting functionality either in an API management layer or in the backend before the resolvers are being executed. But the question is, would the traditional rate limiting work for the problems we discussed in the previous slides? Let's try to understand what we mean by traditional rate limiting here. It means whatever rate limiting features which an API management platform supports 
without any consideration about GraphQL characteristics. For example, API-based rate limiting, application-based rate limiting, subscription-based rate limiting, or spiked arrest policies. So any of these rate limiting features will not be a solution for the problems which are unique to GraphQL. So let's look at some ways we can rate limit GraphQL APIs. Size limiting the incoming query. Size limiting means that we allow or deny a GraphQL query based on the incoming query size. This means we calculate the number of bytes of the incoming query and take a decision depending on that well. But as we discussed, even a small query can be costly to resolve on the back end. So this is not a very good solution. Query byte listing. This is to maintain a set of byte listed queries and allow only those queries to be executed. This would mean that uh, we are hindering the ability for the clients to be expressive. And it would also mean that onboarding new clients uh, with varying requirements can be troublesome. So we think this is also not a good solution. The next two methods, which are depth-based and complexity-based rate limiting, is what we what we think the most practical solution for rate limiting GraphQL APIs. Let's look into each separately and understand what they mean. What we mean by the query depth is the number of levels a query has. This is depicted on the image you see on the right. More depth means more fields, and more fields in the query means more data to resolve on the back end. So if the SDL has cyclic relationships, a deeply nested uh, query can be a norm. So although any queries that can grow, only in a cyclic relationship, it can grow indefinitely. However, sometimes these type of relationships are required for certain applications. And therefore, we need some mechanism to still support a relationship as such while having a protection to the service. So the solution for this scenario is to support a mechanism where query can be blocked if it exceeds a certain threshold. Uh, this we call as rate limiting based on a query depth. Next, let's look at rate limiting based on query complexity. What we mean by query complexity is a computational overhead associated with resolving the query. The challenge here is to compute the complexity without actually executing the query in the back end. So this actually can be performed in two ways. One is using static analysis. So in this mode, it does not need to interact with the backend to compute the complexity. It just looks at the query and computes the value. It provides an upper bound for the complexity. So the figure may not be 100% accurate, but it provides an upper bound so that we do not underestimate the value. 
The next method is dynamic analysis. This analysis depends on probing the backend to determine the number of objects involved, involved without resolving them. So this works via involving cheap queries to support calculating the cost. Here, the measure is accurate, but we have a trade-off on an of an additional runtime overhead and maintaining extra operations in the SDL to support this. So WSO2 API Manager has chosen the static approach due to its simplicity and effectiveness. Let's briefly understand the flow associated with it. First, the API designer can specify a complexity value for each field in the SDL. In order to do this, the designer needs to have some level of understanding of the backend implementation. This is to understand the cost associated with each field. So multiple subscription tiers can be created via the admin portal of the WC2 API manager, where we can specify a certain max depth and max complexity value. So once it is done, the app developers can choose suitable tier based on their requirements of their applications. In the runtime, when API manager receives a request, it will do a static analysis to compute the depth and the complexity value of the query and allow or deny the call depending on that. Okay, uh, now that we understand the theory behind the depth and complexity and the uh, requirement to have rate limiting based on that, let's see this in action with the WC2 API Manager 3.2. Over to you, Ruby. Use API Manager's static query analyzer to rate limit GraphQL APIs. Let's start off by creating a GraphQL API in the publisher. Click on Create New API and select GraphQL. Then upload the valid schema definition file and click on Next to provide the API details. In this demo, we will be using an API which provides information about countries and continents. Once created, publish the API. To get a better understanding about the API, let's have a quick look at the API's operations. This API has six operations which can be used to get information about either all or selected continents, countries, and languages. Let's try out the API in the developer portal. Since we need a valid access token to invoke the API, let's create an application subscription using the subscription generation wizard. Provide application details, and select the subscription policy and generate keys and obtain an access token. Copy the generated access token and open the tryout panel of the API. Paste the copied access token to the security configuration. APIM ships with the built-in GraphQL tryout console for GraphQL APIs. This is the gateway URL of the API. The GraphQL tryout panel has the options to build the documentations, to execute a query, to prettify queries, to build query history, and an explorer option which can be used to build and get a better understanding of the API schema and a complexity analysis option to give the complexity values 
of each field of each type. This can be used by application developers to get a better understanding of the cost of their queries. We can also use the Explorer to compute a query. Let's start off with a simple query to retrieve the countries and the continents. As you can see, it will return a list of continents and its corresponding countries. Now, let's say we extend this query to return a list of other countries in the same continent. Now, as you can see, this can be extended into a deeply nested query with an infinite depth. Such deeply nested or cyclic queries can have high computational overheads and can cause resource exhaustion. So how can we protect our APIs from executing such queries? The answer to that is to implement a subscription policy which enforces a limit on the maximum depth of queries which can be executed. Let's open the admin portal and create a new subscription policy. Click on add policy and specify policy name and quota details. Then specify the maximum query depth as file and save the policy. Save the API from the publisher and open the subscription configurations. You will see the new policy listed. Select the policy and add it as a business plan to the API. Next, go to the developer portal and create a new application subscription with the newly created subscription policy. Copy the generated access token and open the tryout panel. Select the new application and paste the access token. Now let's try out the previous query with a depth of seven. As you can see, this query request will get throttled out. Since the maximum query depth allowed by the policy is five and the query has a depth of seven, the query violates the maximum depth constraint, thus resulting in throttling. This is referred to as depth-based rate limiting. Now let's look at whether query depth always correctly reflects a computational cost. Let's look at a different scenario where we have two queries of the same depth. The first query will retrieve the name of the country and its languages. The second query will retrieve the name of the country along with its continent. As you can see, both these queries have the same depth of four. Now, does the depth necessarily reflect the computational overhead or complexity of these queries? Hypothetically, let's assume that the computation of the field continent is significantly more expensive than that of the field languages. So in that scenario, although these two queries have the same depth, they will have different computational costs due to the difference in the complexity of the fields retrieved. Therefore, treating two queries the same simply because they have equal depths seems unreasonable. Now, how can we address this issue of same depth queries having different complexities? What we can do is we can modify the subscription policy created earlier to include a threshold for the maximum complexity allowed for the query. We will set the maximum complexity as 5. Let's remove the second query from the tryout panel and open the API from the publisher field and open its runtime configurations. Edit the query analysis values 
to update the complexity values. These values reflect the cost of computing the field. Each field of each type has a complexity value assigned to it, and by default, the value is set to 1. Let's modify the complexity value of the field counted down to 2 to reflect its high computation cost and save the configuration. Let's go back to the developer portal and calculate the cost of the two queries. The complexity of the first query will be 1, 2, 3, and 4. Since the query has a complexity of 4, it does not violate the maximum complexity constraint and therefore will get executed. Now let's try the other query where we retrieve the confidence. In the scenario, the complexity of the query will be 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. As you can see, this request will get throttled out since the query complexity of 5 exceeds the maximum complexity specified in the policy. Using depth or complexity analysis in isolation for rate limiting will not be as successful as using both in conjunction. In the scenario where both depth and complexity are used for rate limiting, the static query analyzer will first give priority to the depth of the query. If the depth is less than the policy's maximum depth, then it will check whether the query complexity exceeds the policy's maximum complexity value. Let's try that out. First, let's edit the subscription policy to update the complexity value to 7. Then, let's try the query to retrieve the continent and its countries recursively and limit the query depth to 6. When we first execute this, you can see that it gets throttled out because of the maximum depth constraint violation. Let's reduce the depth to 5 and rerun it. Now, although the depth constraint is satisfied, the query complexity of 8 violates the maximum complexity constraint and therefore the query is not executed. Once we reduce the complexity of the query to 6, you can see that it gets executed successfully. In summary, a GraphQL API gets executed only if it's satisfied. So the GraphQL API query gets executed only if it satisfies both the maximum depth and complexity values of the subscription policy. That's all we have for the demo. If you all have any questions, please feel free to raise them now. So we have one question and uh, the question is whether we can use rate limiting based on a depth and complexity value per unit time. Uh, well, actually, when you create the subscription tier, you can also specify a request count per unit time. This means that we have an upper bound for the maximum depth and complexity values for a certain unit time. Right. Uh, we also have another question. Uh, it says, how are arguments handled uh, related to complexity? So, uh, the implementation uh, assumes uh, that the backend supports pagination. Uh, if no arguments are passed, it assumes that the server will limit the number of items in the list because uh, that would be the sensible thing to do. Sending an infinite, infinite number of items will not benefit the client or the server. So the complexity value uh, specified in this publisher portal uh, is the value for sending the default limit of items. So if an argument is passed, uh, we calculate the complexity by uh, multiplying the uh, requested number of items uh, with the uh, argument and uh, we calculate the complexity according to it. So this algorithm is actually explained uh, in our documentation. Okay, I guess that's the question. That's all we have for questions.
Um, so you can download and try out our API manager solution at from wso2.com backslash API management. You can also join our Slack channel and raise any concerns or queries you have with regard to the product. Also, you can uh, raise any issues related to our product in the GitHub uh, URL uh, specified in this uh, in this slide. Okay, so uh, we'll be sending out a, a feedback question form after this webinar ends. So uh, please take a few minutes uh, to answer the feedback form and uh, let us know whether we. Uh, uh, fulfilled your uh, expectations on this webinar. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining. Uh, have a good day.